My name is Robert Carl Cohen. Our subject is, can the Rosenberg case be reopened? With me are Ben Margolis, an attorney who has been active in the Los Angeles area for more than a quarter of a century. He has handled cases uh, originally in the labor movement, then around the 1944-45 era, the famous Sleep Sleepy Lagoon case, uh, then was involved in the defense of members of the Hollywood Ten, and also the defense of members of the U.S. Communist Party who were indicted under the Smith Act in the early 1950s. On my right here is Mr. Luke McKissick, a younger attorney, but one who has also achieved a great deal of notoriety, public attention. Uh, he was a defense attorney in the Sirhan case. He has also defended members of the Black Panthers. He uh, led the very successful defense in the Billy Dean Smith case and has most recently been involved in defending members of the American Indian Movement involved in the Wounded Knee case. Now, before we get into the discussion of the legal possibilities of reopening the case of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, let us go back in time, back to those days, a quarter century ago, when the case developed. And now for a brief historical flashback. On August 6, 1945, an American warplane appeared over Hiroshima and dropped a nuclear fission device nicknamed Little Boy. 80,000 men, women, and children were incinerated. Three days later, at Nagasaki, a mechanism nicknamed Fat Man killed an additional 75,000 Japanese civilians. The Second World War ended with the United States in sole possession of the most powerful weapon in history, the atomic bomb. The ashes of Hiroshima had barely stopped smoldering when a new conflict arose, the Cold War. The American people were informed that Russia, their steadfast ally in the struggle against Hitler, was the new enemy, communism the new threat. The USA's atomic arsenal was a key factor in its Cold War foreign policy. But while knowledgeable scientists predicted that the USSR would have its own A-bombs within four to five years, the US military scoffed at such predictions. Ranking generals insisted the Russians were so backward they wouldn't be able to build an atomic weapon for 15 to 20 years. It was only four years after Hiroshima, however, on September 24, 1949, that President Truman announced an atomic explosion had been detected inside the USSR. Many Americans were stunned. Their sense of invulnerability crumbled. For some, there was only one possible answer. The secret of the atomic bomb must have been stolen. In June 1950, the Cold War turned hot as hostilities exploded in Korea. On almost the same day that the fighting began, David Greenglass, a machinist while in the U.S. Army at Los Alamos, where the atomic bomb was developed, was arrested by the FBI on the charge of being a Soviet espionage agent. The following month, his brother-in-law, Julius Rosenberg, a New York engineer, was seized on the same charge. The arrests of Ethel Rosenberg, Greenglass's sister, and Morton Sobel, a college friend of Julius Rosenberg, soon followed. In autumn of 1950, the tide of war in Korea turned against the USA as a large force of Chinese troops entered the fighting. Although Truman threatened to use the atomic bomb, the possibility of Soviet nuclear retaliation against American cities forced the United States to rely on conventional weapons. On March 6, 1951, as the casualty list from Korea grew longer, and the nation's anti-communist mood harshened, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and Morton Sabell went on trial. The charge? Conspiring to steal the secret of the atomic bomb and transmit it to the Russians. The presiding judge was Irving R. Kaufman, the chief prosecutor, United States Attorney Irving H. Saple. His assistants included Roy M. Cohen, later to achieve notoriety as an investigator for Senator Joseph McCarthy. The defendants? Their chief accusers, the prosecutor and the judge, were all Jewish. But although the trial took place in New York, the city with the largest Jewish population in the world, not one member of the jury was a Jew. The source of almost all the charges was David Greenglass. Greenglass declared that back in 1944, his sister Ethel and brother-in-law Julius had asked him to acquire information about the atomic bomb, that he had done so in early 1945, providing them with sketches and technical details. Harry Gold, a self-confessed spy already in prison from a previous case, claimed he had been sent by the Russians to see Greenglass in New Mexico and had identified himself by saying, I come from Julius, and presenting a matching section of a cut jello box top. 
David Greenglass testified the Rosenbergs told him they had received a console table as a gift from the Russians. Ruth Greenglass, David's wife, claimed that Julius Rosenberg told her the console table was modified for microfilming secret information. Max Elitcher accused Morton Savell of having been present when Rosenberg asked him to provide classified information. The Rosenbergs and Savell denied all charges. After 14 days of trial and eight hours of deliberation, the jury found them guilty as charged. Savell was sentenced to 30 years in prison. David Greenglass, having pleaded guilty, got 15 years. In sentencing Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, Judge Kaufman declared, I believe your conduct in putting into the hands of the Russians the A-bomb years before our best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb has already caused the communist aggression in Korea, with the resultant casualties exceeding 50,000. And who knows but that millions more of innocent people may pay the price of your treason. It is not in my power, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, to forgive you. Only the Lord can find mercy for what you have done. You are hereby sentenced to the punishment of death. You shall be executed according to law. Who were these master spies, these arch subversives? Ethel Rosenberg was born in New York's Lower East Side. She had three brothers. David Greenglass was the youngest. After graduating Seward Park High School before the age of 16, she became a trade unionist and strike organizer. Married at 23, she and Julius had two sons, Michael and Robert, who were seven and four years old at the time of her arrest. Julius Rosenberg also attended Seward Park. After graduating from New York City College, he and Ethel married. Employed by the government as electrical engineer during World War II, he was active as a union organizer. In early 1945, he was fired from his job for alleged membership in the Communist Party. The following year, he opened a small machine shop in partnership with his wife's brothers, Bernard and David Greenglass, with whom he later had severe business disagreements. The nation's anti-communist mood was so intimidating that most lawyers approached had refused to handle the Rosenberg's defense, and they had to rely on Emanuel Block, an attorney with no previous experience in criminal cases. Most people were afraid of being associated with what the press proclaimed the crime of the century. But the shock of the death sentence was so disturbing that a growing number of people, few of whom had known the defendants personally, now began to run the risk of speaking out. Rosenberg's Sibel defense committees were formed. Newspaper and magazine articles began to question the validity of the trial, and a movement for clemency grew across the USA and around the world. Despite the appeals of first hundreds, then thousands, then tens of thousands of people, and despite the repeated request for judicial review, Time and time again, the courts refused to reconsider the Rosenberg's conviction. In contrast to those who appealed for clemency in a new trial, there were others who insisted that the Rosenbergs were vicious criminals who deserved to die. Also, the FBI, Un-American Activities Committee, and other government agencies listed as subversives, everyone who participated in a Rosenberg-Sobel Defense Committee, or sent a letter or telegram pleading for mercy. On June 15, 1953, as thousands of pro-Rosenberg demonstrators picketed outside the White House. The Supreme Court, in a 5-4 to four decision, denied a petition for a stay of execution. Unless President Eisenhower granted a last-minute reprieve, the Rosenbergs were to die in three days. The next day, while Manny Block brought the Rosenberg sons to Sing Sing Prison for a final visit, two attorneys, Bike Farmer from Tennessee and Daniel Marshall from Southern California, although previously unconnected with the case, presented a petition to Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. In it, they raised the crucial point that the Espionage Act of 1917, under which the Rosenbergs were tried, was the wrong law, that it had been superseded by the Atomic Energy Act of 1946, under which the death penalty was permitted only when there was intent to injure the United States, and only when the jury recommended it, which it had not been asked to do. The court had adjourned for the summer, but Justice Douglas delayed his vacation to remain in Washington and ponder the issue. The following morning, he announced his decision. It is important that the country be protected against the nefarious plans of spies who would destroy us. It is also important that before we allow lives to be snuffed out, we be sure, emphatically sure, that we act within the law. If we are not sure, there will be lingering doubts to plague the conscience after the event. I will grant a stay effective until the question of the applicability of the penal provisions of the Atomic Energy Act to this case can be determined by the District Court and the Court of Appeals. So ordered. The Rosenberg supporters were enthused. 
The Korean hostilities were about to end, the anti-communist hysteria diminishing. And new evidence had been uncovered which appeared to contradict important aspects of the prosecution's case. The barrage of last-minute appeals to President Eisenhower mounted into the millions. But Attorney General Brunel was opposed to any delay. He persuaded Chief Justice Vincent to reconvene the Supreme Court immediately. Shortly after noon on June 19th, for the first time in its history, the Supreme Court, Black, Douglas, and Frankfurter dissenting, vacated a stay of execution issued by one of its members. A half hour later, Eisenhower announced for the second time that he would not intervene. The defense attorneys pleaded with the Justice Department to delay the electrocution for one day so as not to desecrate the Jewish Sabbath. Instead, Attorney General Brownell moved the execution time ahead from 11 p.m. to just before sunset. Ethel Rosenberg sent a last letter to her young sons. Dearest sweethearts, my most precious children, only this morning it looked like we might be together again after all. Now that this cannot be, I want so much for you to know all that I have come to know. Unfortunately, I may write only a few simple words. The rest your own lives must teach you, even as mine taught me. At first, of course, you will grieve bitterly for us. You will not grieve alone. That is our consolation, and it must eventually be yours. Eventually, too, you must come to believe that life is worth the living. Be comforted that even now, with the end of ours slowly approaching, that we know this with a conviction that defeats the executioner. Your lives must teach you, too, that good cannot really flourish in the midst of evil, that freedom and all the things that go to make up a truly satisfying and worthwhile life must sometimes be purchased very dearly. Be comforted, then, that we were serene and understood with the deepest kind of understanding that civilization had not yet progressed to the point where life did not have to be lost for the sake of life, and that we were comforted in the sure knowledge that others would carry on after us. We wish we might have had the tremendous joy and gratification of living out our lives with you. Your daddy, who is with me in the last momentous hours, sends his heart and all the love that is in it for his dearest boys. Always remember that we were innocent and could not wrong our conscience. We press you close and kiss you with all our strength. Lovingly, Daddy and Mummy, Julius, Ethel. P.S. to Manny. The Ten Commandments religious medal and chain and my wedding ring I wish you to present to our children as a token of undying love. At 8.06 p.m. that evening, Friday, June 19, 1953, while hundreds of thousands of sympathizers gathered throughout the world, Julius Rosenberg was electrocuted. A few minutes later, when Ethel was strapped into the electric chair, the sun had already set. As Justice Douglas stated in his opinion when he attempted to stay the execution of the Rosenbergs, there may well be lingering doubts to plague the conscience after the event. Well, these doubts have lingered, they have persisted. And now, more than 20 years later, 20 years after the execution, there is a nationwide movement to attempt to reopen the case. This movement, spearheaded by Michael and Robert Mirapol, the sons of the Rosenbergs, led to a rally taking place at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium in Los Angeles. My name is Lee Grant. When I was invited to take part in the rally to reopen the Rosenberg case at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium, I had no idea what was in store. During the weeks before the rally, we performers rehearsed a series of dramatic readings, songs, and speeches. The night of the show, despite one of the worst rainstorms of the year, we faced a full house of almost 3,000 people. Roscoe Lee Brown started the evening and was then joined on stage by several other members of the cast. Suddenly, a loud explosion rang out above them. 
At first we thought one of the stage lights had burst, but then we began coughing and our eyes started to burn. A cloud of noxious gas filled the auditorium. Some fainted, others gagged and vomited. Our eyes and lungs seared, we left the stage and headed for the nearest exit. Over the microphone, the crowd was urged to remain calm and leave the auditorium as quickly as possible. The police and fire department soon arrived. They tried to clear out the gas and determine what kind of bomb had been used. Apparently, it wasn't tear gas, the effects of which are lessened by water, but some combination of nausea gas and mace, which reacts even more violently when exposed to moisture. And there we all were, standing outside in the rain. Someone calling themselves the provisional wing of the National Socialist Liberation Front later claimed responsibility for the attack. When most of the audience refused to leave the vicinity of the auditorium or be intimidated by the act of senseless violence, we performers decided to resume the rally. Almost 2,000 people re-entered the partially gas-filled hall, much more than was expected after standing outside in the rain for one hour. The house lights remained on and policemen lined the sides of the auditorium in case anything else was attempted. We in the cast were so moved that we came on stage to applaud the audience for returning. The rally resumed with a series of speeches and folk songs. Following our presentation, Michael and Robbie Mirapol, the sons of the Rosenbergs, appeared to a standing ovation. They described their parents as they had known them in childhood, how they felt about the execution, and what they were now doing to try to reopen the case. At the end of the evening, sometime after midnight, audience, performers, and speakers joined in the much-used song, which really summed up everyone's feelings about the evening. We shall overcome. If the efforts of those who launched the gas attack at the rally to reopen the Rosenberg case had been successful, that would have been the last that anyone had heard about this movement. However, in the United States, as in many other countries, attempts to silence freedom of speech and people who want to know about things and want to examine things in light of day often result in just the opposite, and they have in this case. There has been more public attention paid to the efforts of Robbie and Michael Mirapol to get the case against their parents reinvestigated since the bombing attack than there was before. As a matter of fact, there have been magazine and newspaper articles galore one of the most recent ones is this one in New Times. Were the Rosenbergs framed? It asks the question and then goes into detail. The photograph of Michael and Robbie Mirapol, the sons of the Rosenbergs, holding a photo of their parents. And it's a very excellent article dealing with the issues involved in the case. Now, the activities of these two young men in traveling across the United States have become quite well known. They've been seen on many television shows. And as a matter of fact, Mr. Luke McKissick, one of our panelists here tonight, had the opportunity of interviewing Michael Mirapol recently. Yes, Bob, I did. And the threshold question which I asked Michael Mirapol was, are there grounds for reopening the Rosenberg case? Well, there's no question. There were grounds for reopening the case, in our opinion, the day the trial ended. The trial itself was a judicial travesty. The uh, evidence, as you know, of course, was only oral evidence. And the veracity of the people who testified against my parents, specifically David and Ruth Greenglass, my mother's brother and sister-in-law, has been seriously challenged and even was disproven before the executions in 1953. So the facts have always cried out for, once again, getting the witnesses on the stand where they must testify under oath and being able to cross-examine them knowing a heck of a lot more than the understaffed defense effort was able to do in 1951. So, yes, there were grounds in 53. Those grounds still exist. The case is still a travesty this many years later. Michael, I've always been amazed and, quite frankly, only recently did I learn that the trial, I think, lasted, what, only three weeks? Less than that, two weeks. Two weeks and a treason trial for which two people were put to death. 
And I think the transcript was something like 1,900 pages long, which is certainly not a long transcript. And that 1,900 that pages includes the first appeal. Could you uh, embellish upon what you just said? What, what are some of the outstanding points that you think uh, yeah. should be made to point, point out the fact that right. there was no fair trial and that an unjust result was reached? Yeah. Well, from our point of view, of course, I mean, the most important thing to prove is that it was a frame-up. And uh, I think the best way to deal with that is to try and, obviously we can't prove it until you get those people on the witness stand, but to try and point up inconsistencies and dishonesties in the prosecution witness's testimony. Now, really, we're only talking about David and Ruth Greenglass, the chief prosecution witnesses. They said my parents agreed with them to commit a crime. Now, by the way, you described it as they were convicted of espionage, and then you mentioned it was a treason trial. You're 100% right. It is, was a treason trial in the newspapers and in the minds of the jury. There's no question that it was a treason trial. But one of the legal travesties is that the government was able to try them for treason by using the Espionage Act and a conspiracy indictment so that they weren't limited by the treason statute, which is in the Constitution. Because under the treason statute, you must have testimony from disinterested witnesses to overt acts. And there are no overt acts. All there is in a conspiracy is two or more people agree to commit a crime. And in federal cr criminal justice, all you have to do is convince a jury that uh, two people who say they agreed to commit a crime are telling the truth, and the two people who say they didn't agree to commit a crime are lying. If you can convince a jury that, they can vote conviction. And that is exactly what it was, the word of the green glass about conversations with my parents versus the words of my parents. So how did the government convince the jury? Not with documents, not with blueprints stolen, not with anything like that. They convinced the jury by asking my parents if they were communists. They took the Fifth Amendment, that's it, conviction. That's something I'd like to follow up because that's something that's always bothered me about this case, is that if that case were tried today, the questions that were asked by the judge and by the prosecution, uh, uh, the, the large majority of them could not have been directed. Uh, particularly, I have in mind some questions directed to your mother. Uh, questions about taking the Fifth Amendment before the grand jury. Uh, yeah. Under the existing laws, you could never do that today. That wouldn't be a fair trial. Right. Uh, and, and I think that this is uh, one of the things that shows how our case is an example of the horrendous fact of the death penalty because you can't undo a death penalty. And the fact that now, I mean, regardless of guilt or innocence, by legal standards, my mother would have been entitled to a new trial on the basis of some prejudicial cross-examination. It doesn't mean anything because she's dead. So, you know, the government, in a sense, is lucky in that respect. Let, let, me, let me amplify on that by going over this specific thing for, for your audience. When my mother was on the witness stand, she was questioned about having testified before the grand jury. And when she testified before the grand jury, as you know, when you testify before a grand jury, the lawyer is not with you. Right. So the lawyer just basically said to her, go in and take the Fifth Amendment on everything, which she did. And there's a contradiction between taking the Fifth Amendment before the grand jury and affirming your innocence before the trial. Now, this wasn't just one or two questions. This was hours of cross-examination. The judge and the prosecutor both going at it, and, of course, it totally destroyed her credibility before the jury. Now, after she was safely executed, in 1959, a precedent was established in a U.S. tax case. It was United States versus Grunwald, at which it was decided that repeated questioning about grand jury testimony of this sort is prejudicial. And so my mother's co-defendant, who was not executed, Morton Sobel, since he was part of the same conspiracy indictment, he went to the courts and he said, listen, under the Grunwald precedent, Ethel's cross-examination reflected negatively upon me. Therefore, I'm entitled to a new trial. And the government contested it, of course. And in during the oral arguments, Thurgood Marshall was on the appeals court at the time, and he right. said to the U.S. attorney, if this were Ethel Rosenberg rather than Mort Sobel, what would this bench have to rule on the authority of Grunwald? And the U.S. attorney, without a moment's hesitation, said you would have to reverse her conviction. Now, as I said before, from my brother and my point of view, um, 
this is important, but what we'd really like to do is really prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was a frame-up. Because, as, as you quoted from Santiana, if you don't expose these heinous things in the past, then some other government prosecutor on some other pretext in some other political issue is going to frame people for their motives. I mean, today, for instance, they don't frame leftists who like Russia because Henry Kissinger likes Russia, you know? I mean, in, in the age of detente, there's no point in having a frame-up against people who are friendly to the Soviet system. Nowadays, they frame up black prisoners, American Indians. Those kind of people are the basis of frame-ups today, but it's the same technique. Conspiracy indictments, uh, informers who lie for favors, etc. And to get the public aware of this kind of thing having been done in the past will make it harder for the government to pull the wool over the eyes of future juries. And that's one of the reasons why we, when we go, seek to reopen this case, we don't just do it for ourselves, but we say to people out there, you know, you have a stake in this too. Help us, because we're not just protecting our good names, we're protecting all of us in the future. Michael, let me say, <coughs> yes, uh, not only is the death penalty so final, as you point out, that uh, had Ethel Rosenberg been alive and been in a position to assert the arguments that Morton Sobel did, then she would have been granted a new trial and chances are would, could never have been convicted in a different climate than, than she was. But uh, also the fact that Ethel and Julius Rosenberg are not alive, doesn't that present a legal problem in the sense of if they were alive, they could bring a writ of habeas corpus or 2255 motion. Uh, by virtue of their death, another thing is also uh, prevented, and that is that they're not party plaintiffs in a criminal action. Uh, right, and I think, and now, of course, you know, I really can't read the minds of the people who did this, but I think that the government people themselves, perhaps Attorney General Brownell, who was, you know, as you know, very instrumental in convincing Eisenhower not to grant clemency, I think that these people realized how important it was either to extort a confession, and you know that they sent the director of the Bureau of the Prisons who went to the death cell on June 2nd, 1953 with the execution 16 days away and said, talk or die. Either they do that or they absolutely carry out the executions without a moment's delay because the case was falling apart. For instance, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg and David and Ruth Greenglass testified on opposite points on things that there was no way to verify, conversations they had. But there were some specific things that did creep in, like the Green Lesses testified my parents had a console table, a gift from the Russians, it had a hollowed out portion for microfilming, etc. My parents said it was an ordinary table, bought at Macy's for 21 bucks. The prosecution introduced furniture catalogs, and everybody had to point to what kind of picture looked like it, and the prosecutor on cross-examination said to my father, don't you know, Mr. Rosenberg, you couldn't buy a console table at Macy's in 1941 for less than $45? And my father said, no, I'm sorry, I bought it for 21 Well, it just so happens that although both the defense and the prosecution at the time of the trial thought it had been sold for junk, in fact, one of my aunts had saved it in her basement. And this table was then used in my grandmother's house when she took Robbie and I into her home. And I, I walked by this table every day, you know, countless times. How was I to know, to know it had figured in the trial? None of my relatives went to the trial. That was part of the hysteria of the time. They were frightened away. The lawyer, as part of the hysteria of the time, didn't have people helping him, uh, so he didn't have anybody to do research to try and track down the table. He didn't know the table was saved by an ant. Finally, they find the table in April of 1953. And sure enough, it's my parents telling the truth. It's got no hollowed out portion for microfilming. A Macy's person looks at it and says, the markings show that Macy's sold this kind of table for how much? $21 around 1941. So that's the truth. Um, what else? Um, no hollowed out portion for microfilming. And it's much less elaborate than all those furniture catalog pictures. Well, here's a perjury on the part of the green glasses. Truth on the part of my parents. The jury never saw this. You would think that this is obvious grounds for at least an evidentiary hearing to see if the green glass has committed perjury by cross-examination, bring the table in, etc. The judge was the same judge that had been a second prosecutor at the trial. He refused to hear it. He refused to look at the table. He wrote his opinion denying the motion before he heard the oral arguments. 
How do I know that? Because after hearing the oral arguments, he retired for 10 minutes, then came out and read his opinion. It took him 30 minutes to read it. So, I mean, we know that. And they gave it the bum's rush, basically. But the fact that was uncovered must have scared the pants off of some of those government officials who said, geez, if they can uncover this, who knows what else they'll uncover. And in fact, as early as 1955, if I can for a minute hold this book up, as early as 1955, a man named John Wexley wrote a book, The Judgment of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, in which he proved all sorts of perjury, just on the basis of inconsistencies in the trial transcript and some personal research. Perjury is on the part not only of the green glasses, but also of another corroborative witness, Harry Gold. So the factual issues are really strong, and it's only the inability of our side to get subpoena power all these years that has prevented us from blowing it out of the water. The feelings of Michael Mirapol and his brother Robert, sons of the Rosenbergs, about what happened to their parents are very strong. And their primary concern in attempting to reopen the case, of course, is in also exposing what they feel were the inequities of the trial. However, Mr. Ben Margolis here on my left and Mr. Luke McKissick on my right, you're both attorneys. And I believe many people are very interested in the legal question, the real basic legal question involved here of can the case be reopened from a legal point of view. And I would like to pose this question to you, beginning with, is there a legal basis under, let us say, the Freedom of Information Act to require the Justice Department to turn over the 25,000 pages of files on the case to either the Rosenberg sons, their attorneys, historians, or the public in general? I think that there is an excellent legal case in that regard. But all that will do is make public the information that is available in the FBI, CIA files, uh, Department of Justice files. And I would indeed be surprised if uh, it, it doesn't turn out that by some mysterious happening of which we will never know the basis, uh, most of those records are no longer in existence. Uh, however, uh, it is necessary to press for everything that is available, and I would hope that there is enough that has been maintained and that cannot be concealed that will help to open up this case as it should be opened up. Well, do you, do you think that the government would delete or destroy or lose things that might be embarrassing to them? Uh, there have already been indications by the government that uh, in made in response to requests for the information that some of these records have been, and I quote, I use the word they use, lost. And uh, of course, records can be lost, and sometimes it's very convenient to have lost them. So uh, could they and would they do it? It seems to me that uh, having gone through Watergate, uh, having seen uh, uh, how the CIA has lied about its activities, and uh, in my opinion, the FBI uh, does not uh, have any greater integrity than the, the CIA. Uh, it would indeed be surprising to me if you got a complete disclosure of all of the records that exist. Um, they had shredding machines back in the 1950s. <laughs> they had shredding machines, but, but do you think that this, I mean, uh, let us presume the uh, self-interest of government agencies. In other words, rather than the old assumption that the government, you know, would always tell the truth, let us operate on this assumption that government agencies would practice self-interest. Do, do you think that they would go to the point of attempting to go through some 25,000 pages of testimony and trying to eliminate all traces of, let's say, an FBI interview with David Greenglass at the time of his arrest or with Harry Gold? Now, uh, there was a program called The Unquiet Death of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, I believe, in which uh, one of the FBI investigators who dealt with Harry Gold stated that in the first several months of the case, uh, pre-trial, he asked, they kept asking Gold, well, who were you supposed to tell Greenlass had sent you? And he kept saying, well, I think it was Dick or Tom or somebody like this. And then only after Julius Rosenberg was arrested, uh, did the FBI man say, well, do you think it could have, it, it could have been Julius or something like that, or Julius? And then Gold said, oh yes, that was it. Julius sent me. Now, this might be interpreted by a court as prompting of some kind. Do you think that, that they would now go back and try to destroy the physical record of that after it leads to these things have already been stated? 
I have a feeling that that's been done a long time ago. I mean, uh, there's a reawakening of interest in the case, but I strongly suspect that uh, long before J. Edgar Hoover uh, passed on, that um, the records were probably taken care of, but, you know, after the death of the Rosenberg, shortly thereafter, maybe even before in many instances. Of course, we have Watergate with an example of uh, tapes and other things which are highly incriminating, even to the president, which were not destroyed. So is it a hopeless case? But I venture to say that if uh, Nixon hadn't overestimated his political strength and had it to do over again, those tapes would have been destroyed. And as a matter of fact, I think it was Haldeman who said that the one mistake that they made was in not destroying the tapes. Uh, I doubt if the government entities will be inclined to make the same mistake twice. Well, now, let, it, let, let us presume, therefore, that things go this way. Still, you feel that from the, based on the clauses in the Freedom of Information Act, that a suit can successfully be launched, carried out, to get whatever information is available made public to whom? To the public, to the Rosenberg Sons, or who? Well, anyone who, under the law, anyone who has a legitimate interest in uh, seeing those records, uh, which would include, in my opinion, the Sons, and would include historians, uh, uh, persons who were uh, uh, looking into the records for any legitimate reason, would have uh, the right to see them under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, political persons would have a right to see them. Congressmen would have a right to see them uh, because it, would, it might disclose uh, uh, the manner in which the government had acted. So there are many people who have a legitimate interest in seeing those records and who, under the Freedom of Information Act, would be entitled to see them. I am inclined to think that the uh, litigation will succeed, and while I think that uh, the, uh, it may well very well turn out that many of the records do not exist, uh, I think that they will have to produce some records, and ordinarily, if they play around with the records, the very fact that they have done so will become evident. I think what somebody is going to sit down and do once an order is made by the courts, and I think the chances are very good that it will be made, somebody will sit down and say, well, are we going to be hurt worse by giving them all of these records, or are we going to be hurt worse by uh, getting rid of some of them? Uh, whichever, court, whichever way they move, the, whatever is produced and what is not produced will be revealing and will help to establish the truth. Yes, because it would be very difficult to orchestrate, um, especially since perhaps the destruction of records may have occurred throughout a number of years, to orchestrate uh, the destruction of the records in such a way that you wouldn't get something out of what you learned. Uh, for example, let's say that there were some, damage, there were some damaging memos that were destroyed, say, shortly after the death of the Rosenbergs. And, uh, uh, not maybe in serious contemplation that there, were, that there was going to be a wholesale examination or that the Freedom of Information Act was going to come into existence. And therefore, um, this kind of uh, uh, crazy quilt uh, approach to the destruction of documents, if it were self-revealed, uh, might show that there were noticeable gaps and, in fact, there were records that had been destroyed. We may never learn what those records are, but we would know, in fact, that there were records that they thought were so... Uh, damaging to the government's position that they had to be destroyed. So, so uh, I gather both of you gentlemen are in agreement that you feel that from a legal point of view, there can be a compelling suit, that these records can be made available uh, based on the act which was passed over uh, President Ford's veto, the, the Strengthened Act, and that even if there are deletions made, purposeful deletions, that uh, it will be very difficult not to, uh, let's say, compromise the government's position by these strange gaps in the records. Uh, what's the old quote? Uh, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice, practice to, to deceive. deceive. I forget who, <laughs> who originated it, but I think it certainly held true in the Watergate case. But now let us go on to, to a, a next uh, point. Let us presume that the records are made available uh, to the public or to the Rosenberg Sons. And the records do contain information which tends to bring into question the prosecution of the Rosenbergs and their conviction. What then? That's, that's to me, is the, um, that's the, that's the thorny question, because uh, the conventional way of trying to reopen a case, a criminal lawsuit, where somebody's been convicted is via the root of habeas corpus, what we call uh, under Section 2255 in the federal courts. 
the only thing is it requires a corpus and uh, requires a live human being. And of course, we're talking about two executed individuals. Uh, it used to be, the old law years ago, was that you actually had to be confined within an institution in order to bring the writ. And then this was expanded so that if uh, you were on parole or on probation and you were challenging the legitimacy of the probation or the parole or some of the conditions that you had to operate under, you had the right to bring it. But it has never been extended to any person who is deceased, and I cannot really envision uh, any court in this country uh, changing that principle and giving standing, let us say, to the Rosenberg sons to assert under a writ of habeas corpus uh, this kind of claim. Of course, this emphasizes what uh, Michael Mirapol made so abundantly clear, the finality of the death penalty, and that uh, I don't know what uh, you people have seen, but I've seen uh, no provable resurrections in my lifetime. And so I think it shows that, uh, in essence, the difficulty here is that once the party is dead, in terms of the usual method for criminal law relief, you just don't have it available. That's going to be an obstacle in that area, no question about it. How, how do you feel about that, Mr. Martin? Well, I, I completely agree, but I think that uh, we must look at the question in a somewhat broader, from a somewhat broader viewpoint. What, what, what is it that can be accomplished now? Uh, the execution of the Rosenbergs cannot be undone. And uh, the reason for the rule is uh, that the courts will not intervene under such circumstances is technically a very valid one. The courts say there's nothing that we can do, and our, our function is to remedy a wrong that has been done. We cannot remedy this wrong even if we find that it was done, and therefore, uh, uh, we have no jurisdiction to act. But let us examine what the purpose of such a proceeding would be. Uh, it is not and cannot be to remedy the wrong because that can never be accomplished. What purpose it has is to reveal historically the innocence of the Rosenbergs and to establish that if indeed there was a conspiracy it was the Rosenbergs who were the victims of that conspiracy rather than the participants in it. This is terribly important from another viewpoint, uh, and that is that we are now engaged in a great uh, political effort, which I hope will be carried through thoroughly, but uh, very well may not, and that is we are examining the manner in which organizations like the CIA and the FBI have functioned uh, for the alleged purpose, at least, of preventing them in the future from abusing the law and abusing the right of individuals. Well, then, now, that then, function still remains. Okay, let me, let me, that purpose still remains. Okay, now the, the, that essentially is a, let's say, a public service political function, but I, I want to be very specific about, is it possible, let's say, if, if I were Michael or Robbie, and my parents had been executed, and now evidence was re uh, revealed which indicated that uh, perjury had been uh, suborned, that the perjury testimonies had been accepted against them, or forged documents. You mean to say that I could not bring a court action to have my parents' wrongful, wrongful conviction overturned or to demand some kind of review of the evidence? I just, are they helpless? Uh, at the way the law stands today, they are. It is conceivable, but highly unlikely that that law would be modified. But I think the mistake is in that putting the question the way you put it. I see. Because the question is not, can you go to court? The question is, can you accomplish the purpose that has to be accomplished through any means? And uh, there is perhaps a more appropriate way, even than a court, for accomplishing this. The objective today is a political one. It isn't a legal one of, of correcting a wrong. That's generally the purpose of, of a legal proceeding. Somebody has been civilly wronged or criminally wronged, and you go into the courts and say, give me relief, correct it, get me, release me from prison, uh, uh, take me off parole, uh, pay me a money judgment for uh, the wrong that has been done. None of these things can be done for the Rosenbergs. For the historical purpose, it seems to me that congressional investigation and correct congressional action is open in many fields and is not only uh, a proper means of uh, proceeding, but is absolutely essential in order to 
deal with the kind of political task that Congress has at least tentatively begun. Well, what kind of congressional action would you envision? Well, there are many different kinds. For example, you will recall that when the investigation was opened with respect to the functioning of the CIA, uh, there was a call for broadening that investigation to include an investigation of the Kennedy assassination and any CIA participation in it. They wanted that opening because if the CIA participated in it, Kennedy couldn't be restored to life, but the conduct of the CIA perhaps could be controlled in the future for the very same reasons as one approach. Uh, the CIA and the FBI ought to be investigated as to their participation in bringing about this horrible result that they were party to for the purpose of enacting legislation or taking other congressional or executive action which will prevent that from happening again. Now this is something that can be accomplished and this is something that historically is terribly important and something that can be utilized at the same time to clear the name of the Rosenbergs. Um, and I think that, yeah. yes, I think um, in the Rosenberg case is the ideal vehicle to do this because of it being a, such a great tragedy in that I think you would spotlight some of the grosser abuses of the federal agencies in this case. I'm, I'm bound to believe that uh, they probably went further out on a limb and committed more uh, illegal acts in the course of this trial, then uh, you wouldn't find its duplicate uh, probably in any other area. So uh, this would allow, I think, any uh, uh, comprehensive examination of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Justice, um, that would go into the Rosenberg trial would tell you an awful lot about the machinations of the FBI and its interaction with the various other governmental agencies. And, and therefore, as I say, uh, spotlight the frailties of the organization so that we can uh, not be oblivious of this when we talk about uh, how they operate in terms of uh, restricting them in the future. Now, I'm going to go to a completely other position here, and uh, I just want to ask you, what if, as the government claims, that is to say, the Justice Department claimed in 1953, the time of the appeals, just before the execution, that they had far more evidence than had been presented in court, that it was inadmissible for one reason or another, and, the gov and some people in the government have stated recently that if the files were made public and that evidence came out, the public would be convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that the Rosenbergs were guilty. What uh, if that were the case? I think that that, uh, was that a statement made by Roy Cohn? I believe he was one yes, of the Yes, I think there. Roy Cohn, uh, you have to know, you know who Roy Cohn is, I assume. I am not a relative. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was related to a fellow by the name of McCarthy, if not by blood, by bloodletting. Uh, they both participated in the same kind. Uh, he is a vicious, despicable, and totally untrustworthy individual. And if he says something that, like that is true, you can almost bet your last dollar that the exact opposite is true. And he's saying this in the same way that McCarthy uh, talked about, uh, what was it, the 100 communists yes. in the State Department? It has the same sort of validity. Now, there's one other uh, almost certain indication of proof of the fact that they do not have any such evidence unless they forge some documents. The rules of law were completely disregarded in many respects during the trial of the case. And I cannot believe for a second that if they had evidence admissible or inadmissible, it would not have been disclosed and utilized during the trial. And even if that weren't done, when there was the world, uh, uh, when the world was aroused about the possible execution of the, of the Rosenbergs, and it was an embarrassment to the U.S. government, I cannot believe for a second, even assuming the unlikely probability or possibility that they wouldn't have used whatever they had during the trial, that at that time it wouldn't have been disclosed as justification for the murdering of the Rosenbergs. So you, you feel that if, if there was any evidence even if it was very weak evidence, the government would have thrown it up back oh, in 1953. Now, now, this gets to a point. I just, uh, there was a recent case in this area, a Gary Lawton case. And Mr. Yes. Lawton was, was found innocent after his third trial. And the prosecuting attorney, after the uh, verdict of acquittal, said that he 
he had inadmissible evidence which had it been admissible would have convicted him. And this sounds very similar to what was said about the Rosenberg case. Now, what, this is something that seems to make the public get a little confused. What does a prosecutor mean by inadmissible evidence? Well, I think it is a camouflage, and it's just on a lot, uh, maybe a slightly lesser scale, a, a duplication of Roy Cohn's, uh, you know, uh, absolutely irresponsible comment, uh, if in fact he was the person that made that statement. Uh, and, and I would amplify what Ben said by pointing out that uh, I talked to Morton Sobel after he got out of prison, and for years, the FBI would send people in to visit him inside the penitentiaries and they would say that, you know, your wife is going around and uh, seeing a black man and do, using all their own in, built-in racism and everything else that they could subject him to to try to say, if you will just implicate the Rosenbergs, if you will just make it clear that they were in fact guilty of these crimes. This is after their death. This is after their death. Now, if they had all this evidence, there was nothing to restrict it. I mean, inadmissibility would not be a grounds for failing to produce evidence after people's lives had been extinguished and on was, the grounds that they would be denied a fair trial. That's absolutely ludicrous. So in other words, if the Justice Department did have evidence which was not admissible in a legal proceeding, they still could have poured it out after oh, the execution true. to try to uh, buttress their position. Yes. You know, you know, if they had anything that they didn't produce, uh, I am confident that it would have pointed to the innocence of the Rosenberg. You, you see, there is no purpose or sense in attempting to evaluate what happened from a strictly legal standpoint. Because this case was not tried, the motivations behind it were not, politi were not uh, simply legal of punishing somebody for the commission of a crime. This was the result of a political Cold War policy calculated to establish that the Soviet Union couldn't possibly have discovered the atom bomb without the uh, help of, uh, of spies here. It had this political motivation. It was handled as a political case. It was tried as a political case. They were executed as political uh, victims. And any information that could have been used politically would have been used politically. Well, now, uh, Mr. McKissick, you mentioned Morton Sobel. Yes. And this leads me to kind of throw things back at both of you gentlemen. Now, Mr. Sobel was a co-defendant in the same trial. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. I believe he served 18 and a half years and has, has been out on probation yes. since then. Parole. Parole. Since here you have a corpus for your habeas corpus, could Mr. Sobel demand a retrial or, or an overturning of the conviction from a strictly legal point of view? I don't think there's any question that he would have standing to, say, raise the habeas corpus question. Uh, the only thing is that one of the arguments that he raised is that he wasn't really properly a part of any a conspiracy if it existed, which it didn't. And that uh, he was just sort of thrown in. And the, the conspiracy law is a, is a dragnet, as it's often referred to. It's so very broad. And as a matter of fact, as I recollect, I think the decision uh, was that he could be a part of the conspiracy. It was a two-to-one decision, even given the climate of the times. It was a dissent. Uh, he so much on the periphery that, uh, as I say, it's, it would be difficult for him to dig right into the, to the guts of the Rosenberg case. However, in terms of being a potential plaintiff in court, uh, certainly he has the, he, he's alive. Uh, he's a part of the same case. The only thing is that his petition would really have to show that, um, it would really have to show that, that, that he, that his disadvantages uh, that he suffered by virtue of what happened uh, would lead to a reopening of the case. And that he has attempted to do over a number of years and, and generally unsuccessfully uh, to the pitiful point that was made earlier uh, where Thurgood Marshall, when he was sitting on the Second Circuit, uh, in effect looked down and said, well, there's no relief for Mr. Sobel here, but if Ethel Rosenberg were alive, uh, her conviction would have to be reversed. And that's the position that he's in. You really can't, it's difficult to anchor um, a lawsuit that would bring out everything that was done wrong to the Rosenbergs because uh, Sobel, quite frankly, was, was really a, was not a really a part of anything that went to the guts of the lawsuit. He was just thrown in there dangling. Yeah, except that the only uh, reason that, let's say, a conversation between Rosenberg and Sobel, as reported by Elitcher, who was the only mm -hmm. witness that testified to anything involving Rosenberg and Sobel, could only have been damaging to Sobel if Rosenberg were, in fact, uh, guilty you know, as charged. 
And so Sobel is being sent to prison based upon having known and spoken to Rosenberg is the reason he went to jail. So then couldn't he have said, well, this whole case was won, the government tried it as won, and I want to overturn the case you know, in total because my conviction is based on the Rosenberg conviction. I think that's logical, and in fact he has done this and attempted to do it. But I'm talking about after the uh, files are made public. Yes. You see, would, would possibly there be information within those files that would make an even stronger argument for Sobel as the only living uh, victim of this? That, that sounds promising to me if the right information came forth. There is a possibility that that, that would happen uh, and that the courts would listen. Uh, the courts have been uh, and uh, I think will continue to be very reluctant uh, to reopen this case. Uh, in any way, and that they and they were likely to use every technicality that they can to prevent its being reopened in the courts. Uh, the the probability of the courts reopening, I think, is slight. By this, I don't mean that Sobel shouldn't try, uh, but I think that the courts will use every technicality that they can to refuse to reopen it. And, and as Lucas pointed out. Even though in substance it's one case, there are technicalities which the court can use in as a justification, sound or not, but as an apparent justification for refusing to reopen the case. Well, now, we, our country is, according to all of its ideals, a country based on laws and not men. However, in this instance, Judge Kaufman, who was the yes. presiding judge in the Rosenberg case in 1951, and sentenced them to death and said that the... Uh, their crime was, you know, so enormous, enjoys a position today in the appellate court system, second I believe. Circuit judge. Yes. He's a second circuit chief judge. Chief judge. Chief judge. judge. Now, would he be involved, possibly, in any uh, attempts to reopen the case? Could he stop it because of being the chief judge of the... Uh, well, court? technically, if we're talking about just a matter of law, I'm sure that he would be forced to disqualify himself. But I, I, I tend to think we overestimate uh, the power of the legal institutions. I think we've been doing this thing throughout the discussion, as Ben has correctly pointed out, is that, uh, sure, it sounds good on paper to say that, you know, the law is uh, even-handed and it uh, doesn't look at the individual, it just looks at the principle. But the, this is a case that even the judiciary, they respond to public opinion, often have, uh, would like to sweep under the rug. I mean, as they take, for example, the, the Korematsu decision, you remember the Japanese internment case? Yeah. That's uh, still on the books, but to my knowledge, no court has ever referred to it favorably, cited it, would ever use it for anything, or at least hasn't. I mean, uh, they just soon forget about it. It's a case made specially for the occasion and uh, would only be trotted out if it need be. What if, what if the public were very aroused? What if these files are made public and they do have information, as Michael and Robert Mirapol feel that they do, which points to their parents, if not innocence, at least wrongful conviction, and there, was, and there is a strong public response to this, do you think that the courts could be put into a position of attempt of uh, overturning the conviction or responding to an appeal? I think it's possible. I think it's extremely unlikely. I, I remember the day of the Rosenberg's execution. I was in the uh, Supreme Court that day when the last argument was made to the court. And it was obvious to everyone present that the decision that was made was not a legal decision, it was a political decision. Uh, Frank Werner, who filed an opinion, I think, a week later. Two or days, was, I think, uh, after. Well, after, the, after they were executed, uh, uh, said, uh, why was the court in such a hurry? There were questions presented. Ordinarily, we would at least listen to the questions. We would then decide them one way or the other but to refuse to even hear questions where a person's lives are involved, that's unheard of. But it isn't unheard of in political cases, and you ought to have to understand that the courts act politically also, and they acted politically in this matter, Were you under a legal guise. Uh, now, it, to correct this also requires political action. And while the courts are subject to uh, the effect of public opinion. They do react to public opinion, there's no question about it. Congress is much more subject to political pressures than are the courts. And I think that the, and also you wouldn't have the same kind of technical problems and technical excuses that would be present in the court. 
Again, I am not trying to discourage the concept of Sobel proceeding in this manner. Uh, certainly, if I represented him, I would recommend that he do so. Uh, but I, looking at it from the broad standpoint, I think it would be a mistake to rely solely upon a proceeding uh, brought on behalf of Sobel. I think the important thing is to move with this political case in the political arena and to, of course, we have to move in the legal arena first under the Freedom of Information Act. There you have a good legal, a good legal case. And then from there into the political arena where it truly belongs because from beginning to end it was a political case and it should be corrected politically. Luke, uh, let us presume, all right, that the files are opened, that this is successful, and that there may or may not be possibilities to get the conviction overturned something of this kind. Suppose these files indicate crimes committed, let's say suborning of perjured testimony or suborning, suborning of uh, forged mm -hmm. uh, testimony, would it be possible to bring any kind of action under the law against those police or government officials or members of the prosecution who were demonstrated by the files to have done something improper? That long ago. Well, if we were talking about, say, bringing a criminal charge, um you have a number of problems there. One is that there's generally judicial immunity. Judges, uh, let's say we're talking about Judge Kaufman, uh, could rely upon that under the existing state of the law. Uh, generally, prosecutors have been uh, immune. There's an interesting uh, case in Los Angeles now where there's been a decision against a particular district attorney having to do with uh, the suppression and distortion of evidence in a case. Uh, whether they'd be suable, but uh, the major obstacle I see there is the question of statute of limitations. It's, it's been so long. We're talking about uh, uh, activities that we've been engaged in over 20 years ago. Almost 25. Right. Percent. And um, uh, while in a, in a civil case, sometimes uh, statutes of limitations may not run until the point of discovery, depending upon what we're talking about, is the nature of the lawsuit. In the criminal case, uh, the irony is, of course, their own covering up uh, still allows the statute of limitations to run during the time that they're doing it. You don't have, there just isn't a provision to allow it to be told, or in other words, not run, uh, during the time that this stuff is kept, uh, is kept hidden. If, uh, if a defendant, for example, were charged with a crime and he left the jurisdiction to avoid being prosecuted, say he took a trip to Italy and he stayed there and say it was a seven-year statute of limitations, and then returns to California and says, well, I'm scot-free, the statute of limitations would not be running during this period of time, but it, there is no provision in the law which says that if a person is clever enough or has the machinery so that he's able to sit on top of certain evidence or make it unavailable for a period of time, that uh, he cannot avail himself of the statute of limitations. In fact, it could. So I, I think that would not be too fruitful. And again, I think the, the central point at this late date uh, would not be the question of revenge or vengeance, although I can understand how people might feel that way. I think that the, the the, the greater concern should be, uh, even if somebody can't be convicted, um, trying to point out exactly what they did and why it occurred so that we can try to avoid it in the future. And, uh, and that should be the central aim. So if people wrongfully withheld evidence and perjured testimony was suborned, um, quite frankly, the fact that somebody was not put in jail for it would not be a prime consideration as far as I'm concerned, from my point of view. Well, to me, as, a, as, a, as just a layman, I'm a little, these are new points, you know, things I've never thought about. And you mean that if a judge performs in a, let's say, criminal manner during a trial, that he, mm -hmm. if he permits something that he knows to be untrue to be presented against the defendant, the defendant is convicted, and then it comes out that this took place, that the judge is immune from prosecution? Yes. As is the prosecutor? That's a, a more questionable uh, issue. Um, that can be debated. The question on the judge, uh, that, that judge issue has been decided a long time ago. So that, so that if uh, opening of the files should indicate that, let's say, a government agent, let's say an FBI agent, or somebody else who was involved in one of the original arrests of, let's say, Harry Gold or the Green Glasses, someone like this, uh, there have been several points brought out over and over again by Michael and Robbie about the case and by other people, such as an apparently unusual registration card from an Albuquerque uh, Hilton Hotel, I believe which doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be uh, quite right. proper. Uh, or let's say a document signed by a U.S. immigration official saying that Morton Sobel was deported from Mexico when in fact he was seized by unknown persons at gunpoint and pushed across the border into the uh, hands of, of the FBI. That the individuals responsible 
for these documents and these statements, which uh, if they were demonstrated to be forged or untrue, that because a statute of what, seven years, is it, has passed since well, the time? Depending on the particular crime involved. That they could not be prosecuted for this. I, I think the basic handicap is the statute of limitations. I think you could fashion a, certainly a suit under the Civil Rights Act. Uh, there, there are a number of things that you could probably do, but I think it's time that's against you in this situation, just as it's the Rosenberg's death that's against them in trying to seek relief in a criminal court by a habeas corpus. There's another factor aside from time. There isn't a day uh, that goes by that demonstrable perjury, demonstrable family framing of ever evidence by law enforcement officials isn't shown in court. Mm -hmm. uh, I have yet to hear of the first prosecution for it. Have you heard of any? No. no. You mean in all your, what is I it? have never heard of a prosecution of a law enforcement officer for perjury that that officer has, convict, has, uh, has uh, committed or framing of evidence, although under the laws, procedures could be taken against them. I have yet to hear of a first case. I think that's not a, I, I agree with that sentiment, and I, I would even say this, that the, the leading cases that have visited the United States Supreme Court, such as Napway versus Illinois and several others, where they found egregious conduct by the prosecutor, and they have excoriated the prosecutor, and the cases had to be reversed, and there's no question it's been just classified as criminal conduct. I've never heard of a case where a prosecuting agency uh, then chose the prosecutor and made him a defendant in a future action. And look, I think you should make it clear that those cases that went up to the Supreme Court were not cases in which the prosecutor was being prosecuted. Yeah. They were the cases where the original prosecution by yeah. the prosecutor went up in the court uh, found that the prosecutor had done just unbelievable well, kinds just, of just things. Just a minute, just a minute. I'm, I've been uh, hearing about a case, I believe, down in San Diego where a man went to prison because his fingerprints were reported found at the scene of a crime and now, I believe, a policeman, the investigating uh, mm -hmm. policeman, detective in the case, has now been indicted, I believe, for having transferred the man's fingerprints from some other source? Well, uh, I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 I think that is the first time I've heard of this happening. But I, I want you to understand that it's every day that this kind of thing goes on. It, it, it's flagrant. It, it goes on all the time, and there's simply... What you're asking is prosecutors to prosecute themselves. Prosecutors do not like to prosecute themselves. But all of the things we've been saying gives additional weight to the value of going the congressional route. Because Congress can call these people. They're put under oath. And if they lie, then they are subject to prosecutions now for perjury. You mean, you mean that if, let's say, one of the investigators who, let's say, dealt with Harry Gold 24 years ago, or 25 years ago, actually, it was uh, this back in 1950, before the trial, was called up before an investigating committee of the Congress today and asked certain questions about Gold's testimony at the time. I, I know there are contradictory tapes which have been played recently. Uh, and he denied something, or affirmed something, and it was then demonstrated that he was telling a lie, that he could then be indicted for perjury, even though his suborning of that perjured testimony 24 years ago could no longer be prosecuted. That's, that's how they got his. Right. Uh, his, they were after his for alleged espionage. Entirely aside from the question of his guilt or innocence, I think his, in, his innocence, as I believe, has also largely been demonstrated. But entirely aside from that question, he could not be prosecuted for espionage because the statute of limitations had run. But he was called before Congress. He denied that he had committed any acts of espionage, and he denied uh, certain uh, connections with certain people. And he was then convicted for perjury because he allegedly lied about things that had happened so long ago that they themselves were barred by the statute of limitations. Now, that was, that was used, in my opinion, the law was used there for, uh, for an unjust purpose. But the law can also be used for a just purpose. Now, that would it could be, be used to prosecute uh, uh, prosecutors who lied now about something that happened 24 years now, ago. Now, well, now, now, this, of course, is a very sardonic possibility. That is to say, the possibility that if Roy M. Cohn, who was the assistant prosecutor, and who was mm -hmm. still uh, quite a young man, uh, in his mid-40s, I believe, today, or, uh, for that matter, Irving Saipul, who was the chief prosecutor, or uh, other, uh, Kilsheimer, I believe, if these individuals, or any of the FBI agents involved in the case, were called up today before a congressional committee or any other legally constituted body that could swear them 
and they maintained the positions that they took at the time or that they had not committed any wrong, and then it could be demonstrated that they had, that the Alger his case precedent could be used against someone like Roy Cohn today is, of course, is a very sardonic concept, if that's the right word. Surely could. You think that the, could. the act of perjury would occur when the person gave the uh, false testimony under oath. Well, now, this leads me to, I think, getting into your area, the political question. Let us make certain assumptions. Let us assume that the files are made public, that the files contain information or gaps in the information, deleted information, which seems to bring into question the prosecution and conviction of the Rosenbergs. And let us say that this leads to uh, public concern and a possible investigation of some kind. What would be the repercussions upon our legal system and our political system if, in fact, the Rosenbergs were demonstrated to have been improperly convicted? Just uh, I theoretical. Think, I think there might be uh, uh, an investigation and, to some extent, a cleansing of our legal system. Uh, I think the impact upon the legal system uh, might be similar to Watergate the investigation upon the political system. Uh, I think the Watergate investigation, while it by no means uh, solved the problems of corruption in government, certainly had a healthy effect in that area, and I think that uh, the same effect would result from an investigation uh, of what had been done in the judicial area. Do you think it would be a good thing? Oh, I think it would be a fine thing. I think, I think it's an essential thing. Uh, you see, uh, I think it is necessary for people to understand what is absolutely a fact uh, in American life, and that is that when it comes to political cases, you cannot trust the judicial system any more than you can trust the, the uh, political system. And this has been demonstrated time and time again, so that the people ought to know this fact so that they will be more suspicious of and less inclined to support political prosecutions in the future. It would be a healthy thing. It would perhaps slow up some ambitious young prosecutors or old prosecutors. And uh, all in all, it would do a great deal of good. Uh, and most of all, if we could uncover what role the FBI and the CIA and other similar government agencies played in this, then there are things that can be done by way of laws and regulations that at least can make it more difficult for the thing to reoccur. It would be a, a tremendously important thing, and simultaneously, in the name of the Rosenbergs, the names of the Rosenbergs would be cleared from a historical standpoint, and that's all you can do for them now. Lou? I concur with all those sentiments. You think that it would be a beneficial thing to the legal system and to the nation's politics if this thing if it were demonstrated that there were questionable... Yes, I think it's important that people understand that the legal system is not so pure and it has its limitations and it tends to be uh, uh, inflexible and rigid and can yield a public clamor uh, from time to time. We've seen it in the Japanese internment case that I referred to earlier, uh, in the Rosenberg case and in political cases. I think that people should be aware that uh, in political cases the system just simply hasn't worked. Now, now let's, let's say Let's say there's an investigation. Let's say it is demonstrated that there were in inconsistencies, inaccuracies, even crimes committed within the case by the prosecution. Do Robbie and Michael Miracle, sons of the Rosenbergs, or Morton Sobel, have a basis for an enormous multi-million dollar civil damage suit? One man has spent 18 and a half years in jail. These two young men have had their parents killed. Could they try to get money from the government? Would there be a chance? You have the same problem with the statute of limitations. Uh, the, the cause of action is barred by time. Now, what about the uh, uh, black cavalry unit that was uh, accused of having committed a crime back around in the early 1900s? And they were all, I believe, dishonorably discharged from the service, put in prison for some time and all that. This was down in Texas. And then recently came out a few years ago that there was no substance to it. And I think there was one surviving member and he was given some kind of cash compensation by the government. Oh, that's different. That's <laughs> is that, well, how is that different? Well, so you could go to the Congress. In other words, this would be, you know, uh, and Ben and I have mentioned this uh, to talk to amongst ourselves earlier, um, you could certainly sponsor a bill in Congress and ask that there be uh, recompense paid to the children of the Rosenbergs for the suffering that they've gone through. 
having to change their names, having to uh, suffer the loss of identities and pretend that they weren't who they were all these years. Um, that kind of, Congress has uh, plenary power to do that. No question. Uh, there are, there's, there's a lot of precedent in various areas for rewarding people um, for damages that they've suffered. And um, the Congress certainly would be able to do that. But it would have to be Congress's decision, uh, kind of an act of, uh, I don't know, magnanimity to, to do this. Well, it's an act of justice. Congress can sometimes do justice, too. It's possible. It doesn't do it very often, but it can. Well, uh, <laughs> so you mean, uh, now this again, you see, I, I, I always I, I say to myself, well, suppose I put myself in their position, okay? Suppose I just got out of the federal penitentiary after 18 and a half years, and it was discovered that I was in there improperly. And then you tell me, you know, and you're, I'm sure, you know, you're not ad in an adversary relationship. You're just as friendly advisors saying, you can't do a thing about it. Well, uh, you know that there have been bills passed uh, giving compensation to persons for things of that kind. That has happened not infrequently. It, it, sure. it hasn't happened nearly as often as it should. But uh, there is uh, much precedent for that sort of thing. And in addition, if someone were to introduce a bill uh, proposing such compensation, that bill itself would constitute a basis for a hearing as to whether they should receive the compensation and would be a basis for reopening the whole Rosenberg case. Now, do you think that the law in this instance is good. I mean, I think that's a lousy legal uh, situation. I think that if I do 18 and a half years in jail and my parents are executed improperly, that I should be able to sue for damages and not have to go to a congressman and beg him to submit a bill to try to help me out. If, someone's, if someone uh, wrecks my car, I can sue them. If someone kills my dog, I can sue them. Within, within certain time limits. You see, you, you have here, as you have in many areas of the law, two conflicting principles. One principle is that you've, if you've been wrong, you ought to be able to recover for that wrong in one way or another. You ought to be able to correct it. What about where the government, through its prison system and everything else, has inflicted the wrong and has, you know, has withheld the information that reveals it's wrong? I would like to see a law passed extending the statute of limitations indefinitely in those situations. But I would not like to see the statute of limitations generally abolished or even shortened. Now, isn't this or now? You see, we have a th in in West Germany, for example, there has been a series of extensions of the statute of limitations on war crimes. Right. And people are on trial today for things that they did back in 1941, 1942, way beyond the five or seven or 15 years. And, they can, and whichever government is in power in West Germany, there's a tremendous public demand, and demand, I'm sure, by people in the United States as well, legal authorities, to do this because of the Nazi crimes being so horrible. And I personally think that an extension of the statute of limitations in anything involving the government as a defendant would certainly be a good law. I would favor that. I would, too. I think you know, it would have to be very carefully thought out because uh, you have... You have to realize that the government, of course, also acts through individuals, and there comes a point in time, uh, you know, there's, there's, you want to encourage people. That we're not talking, again, about the Rosenbergs here specifically. You're talking about trying to pass a law that makes sense, because you have to be worried about the law being applied uh, in a case where it could reach unjust, I think. But uh, something fashioned along the idea is the idea of uh, uh, more lengthy statute of limitations for the government. Uh, taking into consideration the fact that the government is in the unique position of being able to withhold evidence and to uh, to do things where the discovery mechanism doesn't go into play in the in the usual way for uh, that things come to light and therefore they, they hide can, things right and therefore uh, taking that into account perhaps the statute of limitations more lengthy or perhaps the statute of limitations which uh, would not start to run until the discovery of the items which give you grounds for grievance uh, and that uh, maybe as a point of departure to start the statute of limitations, something along those lines, I think would be quite helpful. But I do think that would be futuristic and that would certainly not apply to the Rosenberg case and would not be of benefit in this particular situation. Well, uh, since there have, are things coming out now, Watergate related and so on, that may be approaching statute time, I certainly would think that it would behoove some member of Congress to start an act going that would extend the statute of limitations when it involves members of the government from the date of discovery of the alleged uh, offense. Because uh, otherwise, uh, this is 1975, some of the Watergate acts may have taken place. 
back in 68. Some of them are already barred by the statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. Well, in conclusion, can we say this, that the efforts to reopen the Rosenberg case from a political, public information point of view, according to, as far as you gentlemen can see, should have some degree of success. That is to say that the files will probably be made available to the public or to the Rosenberg Sons. But when it comes to the next questions, such as can the conviction be overturned, uh, can an appeal be made from a legal point of view, and then can action be taken against members of the government that may have committed offenses in the trial, you think that these are much more questionable areas of legality? I think, uh, as Lucas said, uh, under the present law, it simply cannot be done. And while the law does change from time to time, it doesn't remain constant, I would be absolutely uh, astonished if a, this kind of a change took case, place in this kind of a case. Uh, so I think that the chances are virtually nil, except for the possibility that exists with respect to the Sobel case. Which is part of the Rosenberg case. Yes, which is part of the Rosenberg case. Uh, Luke, would you My remember? analysis would be the same, and I, and I think that uh, it again accentuates the need to pursue the congressional avenue because the Freedom of Information Act plus congressional inquiries are bound to garner the information so that if there was the possibility of a lawsuit, and as I say, I, I think it would have to be with Morton Sobel bringing the action, um, then those kind of inquiries would have produced the information that would make that judicial lawsuit more likely to succeed and if it were pursued uh, initially. So any way you look at it, it seems to me that we end up pre-Freedom of Information Act and going the congressional route. Well, gentlemen, we have been discussing, can the Rosenberg case be reopened? The uh, members of our panel have been Mr. Ben Margolis and Mr. Luke McKissick, both attorneys. I hope that there will be cause in the near future for us to possibly get together again to discuss new ramifications of this case, certainly after the files have op are opened, uh, the Justice Department files. I want to thank you both very much. This is Robert Carl Cohen. Good night. I had no idea that they would give them a death sentence. And I, every time I heard the buyer was saying something, my wife said, look, we're still alive. We have our kids, everything's okay. Mm. I had no idea that they would give them a death sentence. I had no idea that they would give them a death sentence. I had no idea that they would give them a death sentence. I had no idea that they would give them a death sentence. I had no idea that they would give them a death sentence.